fellow glue sniffers, and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. In this episode, I'm going to be tackling Tamiya's 148 scale Mitsubishi A6M30, also known as the Zeke. This episode is going to be a little bit longer than usual as I show you how to add some scratch details into the cockpit just to make it more interesting. Using things like lead wire or copper wire strands, you're able to replace some missing hydraulic lines or some control cables that may not be in the kit. The nice thing about Tamiya's newer kits is they're generally hassle-free, so you have a lot more enthusiasm and effort that you can put into some scratch building if you like. When the Zero entered service in 1940, it was arguably the best single-engine fighter in the world. It could outturn the Supermarine Spitfire and had just as much firepower as the ME-109, but it was also carrier-based and had three times the endurance the Spitfire did in 1940. The Zero built a name for itself as its initial kill ratio was 12 to 1 fighting Chinese forces prior to the attack at Pearl Harbor. One downfall of the Zero, and one that continued to plague it through its entire service life, was the fact that it had no armor for the pilot and had no self-sealing fuel tanks on the aircraft. Early in the war, Japanese pilots were able to overcome these shortfalls on their aircraft because they had more experience from fighting over China compared to the relatively few American pilots who had been flying with the AVG beforehand. Even though American propaganda at the time depicted Japanese pilots as wearing thick glasses and having poor eyesight, pilots who had been flying with Claire Cheneau's American Volunteer Group knew otherwise. Even though the experience of the Coral Sea and Midway gave the American pilots the experience to at least hold their own against the Japanese Zero, they were starting to scream for a newer fighter to give them the edge. Fortunately for the American naval pilots, the Hellcat and Corsair were already in development, and the Army were starting to transfer the P-38 into service. Unfortunately for the Japanese pilots, the Zero had reached the pinnacle of its development early in the war. Further development of the Zero was making it less effective as it became slower, less maneuverable, and lacked firepower in some variants. Even though the Zero was later outclassed by American fighters, it could still be deadly in the hands of an experienced Japanese pilot. In his book, Baba Black Sheep, Pappy Boynton stated a few times that he was surprised by the Zero's ability to break contact by pulling into a near vertical climb and something that the Corsair he was flying was not able to do. One way for the Americans to break contact would be to put their heavier aircraft into a dive where the lighter Zero couldn't keep up. How much lighter was the Zero? Compare it to the Wildcat and you would see almost a 2700 pound difference in weight. Now let's talk about building the Zero. Tamiya's reproduction of this kit is almost flawless. When you're putting the kit together, there's only one small issue I found, and I'll show you that later on in the video. As for the cockpit pieces and everything else, they almost snap into place with Zero fit issues. I wanted to depict this Zero as a land-based one later in the war that would see a lot of heavy wear and tear, and decided to bring the color basing or black basing technique into the cockpit. What I'm doing here is just adding some lighter white and lighter green tones to that main color and then coming in with a heavily thinned main color again and just gradually blending it back until I'm happy with the variation in tone. Although this tonal difference looks very stark when I finish painting here, by the time you add your wash and blend in some oils, it'll push that back even further so it's not as drastic. One thing that's hard about painting World War II aircraft is finding a good reference to build from. If finding correct tones in American, German, and British aircraft is hard, Japanese aircraft are almost impossible as a lot of color references do not exist for these aircraft and often the photos are recolored and done so badly. Two references that I relied on heavily for this build was the website J Aircraft where the author has gone through almost the entire naval history of paints for Japan and then a guy named Ronnie that does side profiles and painting of World War II Japanese aircraft. I thought I was making progress on the Toki Green Blue trying to come up with a good color for that anti-corrosion paint, but then I found a reference from an aircraft in England that someone had pulled open the inspection panels and the original colors remained inside, and there were six different tones. So just to kind of keep things simple for now, I used the Mr. Color Metallic Green Blue, but I think for the next one I'll use my own mix because I found the Mr. Color Flakes were too big for this scale. The only downfall of painting all this detail into the cockpit is the fact that with this aircraft when you close the two fuselage halves together, there's not much you can see, but it is good practice for when you move on to those bigger kits. I chose to use AK Real Colors for the interior of this cockpit because I found that Tamiya's XF-71 cockpit green was too teal and didn't match some of the descriptions and pictures of Japanese aircraft. Later Zeros would have two different shades of green depending on if it was a Nakajima built Zero or a Mitsubishi built Zero. Once everything is dry in the cockpit, it's now time to seal it in with two coats of clear to get ready for oils and washes. 
To help those thick Tamiya decals settle down into place, I first prep the surface with some micro set, then I'll apply the decal, push it down with a Q-tip, and then after a few minutes I'll apply some micro salt to help settle that into place. Although the Tamiya decals may be thick, they do give you the instrument panel decals in several sections, that way you can get them into place easier. The instrument panel decals are very nicely detailed, so I opted to not bother replacing them with the photo etch cockpit panel. Doing all these side projects allows that clear coat to dry, and now it's time to come back in with some Tamiya panel liner wash to bring out some of those smaller details. The reason I put this on so sloppy in a few places is because I'll come back in with some enamel thinner and blend it instead of wiping it away, so it also acts as a filter for the colors underneath. On this light green color, I decided that the dark brown wash would look better because black was too stark and kind of made it look cartoonish. While the pin washes were drying, I made my own wash using some oil paints just to be a little bit thicker so I could stick in the areas of high traffic like buttons, dials, and things like that. On the radio controls though, that was the best place for the black panel line wash. Once dry, the wash was blended or removed with enamel thinner. And that is why I like working with oil paints because they're so easy to work with and you have so much time to change them if you're not happy with the look. It's kind of funny how I came around to even building the Japanese aircraft on this channel. Initially, I didn't know too much about Japan's aircraft. I knew they had some torpedo planes, dive bombers, and I knew about the Zeke and the Betty bomber, but that was really about it. I didn't know how much depth there was to that genre that I could find out about. And every time I put a video up, and I shouldn't say every time, it was really the last two times I put videos up, this guy named Wojtek, aka Woody, his nickname, would come on and say, man, you have to do Japanese aircraft. You got to try some Japanese stuff. So I looked around on YouTube and there was only a few Japanese builds I could find from Scalaton, Plasmo, and then I seen MM Models did one as well. And then Wojtek added me to a Facebook group on that had celebrated like the zero in Japanese World War II aviation. And then I discovered this complete underworld of like what kits people enjoyed, what liveries were cool and things like that. And it was almost like the nerds had found a new level of nerdiness to go to with all the Japan stuff. Not to rip on just the Japanese aircraft fans, because I know that the British, American, German, Mustang, Spitfire, all those guys, like we all have our levels we go to, but this Japanese group was so small and tighter knit that it finally drew me into building the kit and the stash. They also had a lot of great reference photos and sources to tap into, so I was pretty much committed at that point. So that's how I ended up doing an aircraft from a sort of underrepresented nation in the modeling world. So to sort of segue this into my next part of the build, why don't you write in the comment section below, what is a genre of aircraft or any type of model that you haven't done before and you've had no interest in, but you think you may actually like? Write in the comment section below, let us know. So going back to the build here, you can see the cockpit pretty much goes together like Lego. Even with all the modifications I did with the wiring, there was no issues to be found. And when it closed up, I only had a little bit of a seam to clean up on the top and bottom. I don't know what happened at the Tamiya company after 2000 and not that their model kits weren't already great. They decided to go to another level with their engineering and it's a level that other brands should be looking at because it is outstanding. Even though this Zero was released in 2008 and that's 12 years ago, this was sort of the entry to that new engineering level and it's on par with Tamiya's new Spitfire and P38. And for the price point, it's definitely worth the money. There was really only two flaws I could find in this kit when I was building it. The first one being that the photo etch to fold the wingtips seemed very weak and I could see issues being caused downstream with them busting off and things like that. So I decided to build them extended. And the second issue we'll look at here in a minute. And it's that when you add the wing section onto the fuselage, there's a step between the fuselage and the bottom of the wings. You can see here that this tab to build the wingtips extended is pretty solid, so that shouldn't lead to any issues down the road. I didn't feel too guilty about building the wingtips extended because I have the 132 Tamiya A6M2 in the stash, and that kit has a lot more robust wing fold, so you'll definitely get to see that down the road. Tamiya allows you to build different variants of the Zero by having the gun section on the wing as its own separate piece, which is nice because then you don't have to worry about cleaning up a seam line that runs through a gun barrel like on the older Mustang kit. And now we come to the only real flaw with this kit and that's getting this step here corrected. 
and his flaws go, this one's pretty low key because it was easy to fix just by sanding down and thinning the edges just so the rear of this panel was able to move up a little bit more because before it was binding on the bottom. So with a little bit of test fitting and then some more sanding followed by test fitting, I was able to get that step gone. All in all, it really took about an hour and a half to correct. And with how well the rest of the kit was going together, it really didn't bother me that much at all. This kit gives you the option of building the flaps in the raised or extended position. And I really wanted to capture the lines of the zero, so I decided to build them in the raised position. Quite a few reference photos showed them either up or down, so you really can't go wrong either way. I picked up a Cameo 4 to use for cutting, and one of the first tests I did for it was to cut the masks for the canopy of this kit. Even though to me it includes a mask in this kit to use for the canopy, it was only a matter of going online, downloading the Cameo file, and putting it in the cutter and letting it do the work for me, and all in all it took 5 minutes for this to happen. I also found that the kit decals for the 105 on the tail were too bright, and I liked the artist's impression of the side profile I'd found online, so I decided to go that route instead. If you've ever masked a greenhouse style canopy like the Zero or Texan or Avenger, you know how much a mask that's pre-cut will help you save some time. Then also when you think about things like buying pre-cut masks, you're probably saving money in the long run as well, especially when your friends want you to cut masks for them. Or you have to convert the Canadian dollar to the US dollar and pay for shipping. Womp womp. When it comes to zeros that are still in airworthy condition, there's only one, and that's owned by the Plains of Fame Museum that has the original Japanese sake engine in it. The rest of them have been converted to American engines such as the Wasp, and some flying zeros aren't really a zero at all, and it's actually a T6 Texan that's been heavily modified, like the ones in Tora Tora Tora. Cleanup was pretty straightforward on the kit as well, as there was no overhangs or real issues that had to be fixed before paint. The only thing that needed a little bit of moderate cleanup was the seam behind the cockpit and that was because I've heard reports of ghost seams that were showing up here in some other people's builds so I decided to put a little bit of extra putty and smooth that right out to avoid any issues. And once that was done I cleaned up all the dust and debris and fingerprint oils with some IPA. Once the isopropyl alcohol dried and I had a nice clean surface to work with it was time for primer to get ready for rivets and to see if there was any imperfections in the plastic before paint. This is my first time riveting a model in a while, so I decided to add a little bit more into the video. So I like to use electrical tape because it's flexible to mark my lines, and I'll usually print off a one-to-one -one scale blueprint of the aircraft so I can find the proper pattern. Once everything is laid out properly and it's nice and square, then I come in with the riveting tool to add the rivets. This is a tool that I only spent $20 on, but it's my favorite add-on after an airbrush for bringing more detail to kits. It does require a steady hand and a lot of practice, but you can take a $20 kit and make it look like an $80 kit. And if you want more information on how to do this, I do have a video on this channel called A Riveting Tutorial, and it'll walk you through the process from finding your blueprints to actually getting them on the aircraft. Now it's finally time for paint and where things are going to get a little more interesting. So to add a base layer to build everything off of, I'm going to start with Tamiya's LP11 silver paint. And the reason I'm using this is because it's a lacquer paint, it's very durable, and I'm going to come in afterwards and put an acrylic paint on top of it that I can damage and scratch without ruining the lacquer paint underneath. A few weeks ago on the Japanese Aviation fan page on Facebook, there was quite the discussion between some people that if Japanese aircraft had primer or not underneath their paint. And I referenced a photo that was from the Imperial War Museum that had a section of a zero that did show some reddish brown primer on it. And I decided to use that as my reference just to have a little more interest and contrast under the gray and the green paint once it was in place. Now that the acrylic paint was dry, I just came in with a wooden toothpick and lightly rubbed at it until the paint started to flake away. You don't want to really drive that toothpick in because then you run the chance of actually damaging the paint underneath. Once the primer chipping was done, I sealed that all in with two coats of clear followed by two coats of MIG chipping fluid to get ready for the main colors. I allowed that chipping fluid to dry completely overnight so I would avoid any droplets. Then the next night it was time to come in with some heavily thinned colors and slowly build them up to get a very worn paint look on the aircraft. I love splatter templates because it allows you to use a more 
uneven random effect on the paint for you to do some black basing or color basing with. And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to use the stencils with at least two different colors and then bring back the main color in a very thin down paint and just slowly build it up until I'm happy with the worn effect I'm seeing. I prefer black basing to pre-shading because pre-shading is too even and too rigid in my opinion and black basing just looks more fluid and just has more character to it. I know that this method is going to probably irritate some of the purists who believe that the Japanese Navy aircraft were immaculate and under no conditions the crew chiefs would allow them to get dirty, but let's be realistic here. Naval aircraft do get grimy in some wear and tear, but this aircraft that I'm doing is also land-based in a forward deployed airfield at Rabal, which is pretty much out in the elements all the time, so it's not going to have that nice clean look anymore. And if you've ever done any mechanical stuff outside, you know how hard it is to keep things clean, especially in a dry dry area where there's lots of dust and crap blowing around. Once you're happy with your color basing, it's now time just to slowly cover it back up until you're happy with the overall tone. And I kind of regret painting this green afterwards because I really liked how this gray looked with all the weathering. So I'll have to use that as an excuse to buy another one of these kits. Don't tell my wife. One thing that Wojtek insisted on every time I told him I was working on this model was to make sure I paint the control surfaces a lighter color as that was almost a standard across the Japanese military. So here you go, Woody. I hope that works for you. As I mentioned earlier, to me, his decals are on the thick side. So to avoid any hassle trying to get them to sit properly, I decided just to paint on the markings and they don't get any simpler than Japanese aircraft markings. About a week ago, Woody and I were in the model store trying to figure out which color red was going to be the best one for the Japanese markings. His research was showing them that Insignia Red by Model Master was probably the closest red. And I already had, the, to me, a dull red at home and it was working for the RAF markings. So I decided to grab a bottle of the lacquer red and just try to mix it and see if I could get close to that Insignia Red but still have a little bit of variation just to make it look dull and faded and things like that. And it's something I did different this time with this build is I actually live streamed a good portion of this paint process here. And I think I was on for about an hour and a half. The biggest challenge I found with this paint scheme is I like things nice and tidy and this was the opposite of it. So I had to be as random as possible without making it look like I was trying to be random because then sometimes it looks like it's uniform and you're missing the whole point of what you're trying to do. Truth be told that this camouflage pattern was applied in the field by some guys with a spray gun, so there's no masking, it was just them doing their work. Also, when it came to wear and tear on the aircraft, I wanted to focus it in areas that made sense. I didn't want it completely random, I just wanted it to be in areas that had high traffic from the crew, like changing ammunition, doing some maintenance on the engine, and things like that. I didn't want things that didn't make sense to be weathered, like the outer tips of the wings usually wouldn't have the crew out that far, but there would be damage from coral coming off the propeller and throwing it back at the aircraft. So I may have cheated a bit and used an A6M50 for some of the weathering references, but all the same, the weathering should be in the same area. So that was the reference I used. Another tip I can give you if you're doing this type of weathering with chipping fluid is to make sure you're letting that water sit for a few minutes to really soak and reactivate that fluid underneath. As I stated earlier, I found a picture online that I liked for a reference rather than the box art and instead of using the kit decal I decided to paint on the markings on the tail. So once they are painted on I used a brush to come in and rough them up a little bit and try to make them look more accurate. These numbers were painted on by hand in the field so I wanted them to have a little bit of a rougher look than instead of a clean airbrushed on look. Once the red marking was painted on, I then started to cover that up to match the painting with the airbrush with the same green squiggly lines as the rest of the camouflage. This was definitely one of my most challenging paint jobs so far because one, there was no real example to follow except for having the left side of the aircraft for the photo and the painting that an artist had done. Other than that, there was no top down or side views that were from the real world that I could reference. So a lot of it was just from imagination. The weathering on the cowling followed the same process as the wings, so it was silver paint, two coats of clear, two coats of chipping fluid, and allowed to dry overnight before the cowling color was applied. 
for smaller, more precise chips, I'm actually using the sewing needle. When I used this metallic blue-green earlier, I found that the pigments were too large, so the second time I painted with it, I decided to thin it down a little bit more to see if that helped, and it turned out it actually did make quite the difference. The pilot for this zero would have been Hiroyoshi Nishizawa, I hope I pronounced that right, who shot down 36 claimed victories in the air, although some sources do put it as high as 102. The problem being caused that the Japanese army only claimed aircraft for the entire unit shot down, not per individual pilot. One Japanese ace named Sake who flew with Nishizawa several times wrote that never had he seen a man do with a fighter plane do what Nishizawa could do with a zero. His aerobatics were all at once breathtaking, brilliant, totally unpredictable, impossible, and heart stirring to witness. During one 72 hour period, Nishizawa shot down six Allied aircraft, and to throw salt in the wound a week later, he allegedly was doing aerobatics over an Australian airfield. After taking part in the fighting at Guadalcanal, Nishizawa was returned home to Japan to replace missing pilots and to start training new pilots for the Japanese Air Force. At every chance he could, he demanded that he be returned into combat, and in late 1944 was finally granted his wish as he joined a squadron as an escort pilot for the kamikaze missions. Nishizawa participated in several more kamikaze missions as an escort pilot, but was downed in a transport plane when he was returning to Japan to bring new fighters to the front lines. At this point in the war, Japan had lost their core of fighter pilots and instead were now using their younger pilots to crash aircraft into American ships, and the older, more experienced pilots were filling in the fighter escort role. As we get into the weathering part of this build, I want to ask you as the viewer, how do you pick the next model to build from your stash? I know personally when I look at my stash, sometimes I can be overwhelmed and nothing seems to jump out at me. Or there's the opposite of that, and there's four kits I want to do all at once, which would be untenable. To do something different, two weeks ago I put up a poll on my channel here and asked you guys what did you want to see built next. And I put up four kind of random aircraft, a Hornet, Corsair, a Swordfish, and I can't remember what the fourth one was. And I asked you, the viewers, what did you want to see? And surprisingly, the Swordfish was the one that came up on top. So that's going to lead me to a second question here, and that is... Would you prefer to see one longer, all-inclusive build video for like 25 to 30 minutes like this one, or would you rather have about 10-minute video segments come out that focus a little bit more on the build itself? Let me know in the comment section below. One thing I'm still trying to do and be happy with is exhaust pipes on aircraft. Unlike a car or tank where it's usually thinner, cheaper metal and it rusts completely through, aircraft pipes tend to do the opposite and they don't rust the same way. So trying to do that effect has been hard for me to accomplish. On the Mustang build, it seemed that the steel pigments on top of the sky grade seemed to work out pretty well. It's hard to tell on some older photos. Maybe I got it wrong and the Zero pipes rusted up pretty badly, just like they did in my Honda Civic. It was hard to tell what color to do the drop tank. The instructions called for the fuselage color or belly color of the aircraft. And then I found some photos online of Zeros with aluminum tanks and the way I think about it is those aluminum tanks if they're getting dropped for combat they're probably not being painted because they're not going to be recovered but at the same time I found some photos that did show them painted so I was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place and I chose to do the polished drop tank just to have a little bit of uh, jewel to catch your eye under the aircraft that was mismatched and had the weathering show a little bit so I don't know if that's 100% right but I do like the look of it. With the landing gear, I find that tape is too thick and out of scale for doing the P-clamps for the brake lines, so instead I just decided to paint it on with some unthinned Vallejo paint. For the landing gear wheels, I followed the same process I did with the 124 Typhoon, so I painted them Mr. Color Tire Color, that's weird, and then came in with a very, very diluted XF85 rubber black, just to kind of add some tonal variance. Once all that was drying, I came in and started wet blending some thin down German gray slash black paint just to add some kind of rubbery look to the tire. I'll often look at the tires on the heavy trucks at work and try to figure out how to get that same effect in a model. Sometimes your inspirations can come from the weirdest places. One change I've made from the oil paints I was using before was I've gone from the Amazon set I picked up for like 20 bucks and started using Winsor Newton's oils and I found that those are a lot easier to work with. They blend nicer, they're smoother, and they're just a higher quality paint. 
even being on top of a flat coat, they're still very easy to work with. Now I'm just blending in some black paint to kind of show where the crew would have been accessing, getting grease and dirt and basically crap on the outside of the aircraft. This fuel stain may seem excessive at first, but watch how I come in with some thinner and start dialing it back a little bit at a time. Whenever I see that on the trucks at work, it generally means that the seals underneath are torn. If you've ever cleaned a machine gun, you know how easy it is to get oil everywhere and make a mess. So that's why the gun access panels look this way. But as I stated earlier, if it looks like it's too much, you can always come back in and blend those oils. Looks to me like they better get the cowlings off and check out that oil leak that's coming down the back of the aircraft because that looks excessive. At this point in the build, it's basically time to come to a conclusion. And like I said earlier, this kit is beautiful. And there's only really the one little flaw there of the step, and it's easily fixed. And I highly, highly recommend this kit to anybody who wants to try it. Either you're a new beginner, new into models, or you're an old pro. This is a kit that you can have fun with at either end of that spectrum. And I'm really happy with the way this turned out. I kind of planned for it to be a little less weather than this, so I went a little overboard, but I do like how everything comes together. And I'm very excited to actually have borrowed a good camera to take some photos of this. So at the end of this video, you're actually gonna see a little bit of an improvement compared to when I use my Google Pixel 3 to take them. So as always, I hope you enjoyed this build. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, please leave them in the comment section and I'll try to get back to you. It helps me bring you better content. I am the model guy and I will see you next time when we bring in the swordfish.